Hello, Rob and Femi. Um, so my first question um, is, how did you two meet? So Rob, what attracted you to Femi's story? And to Femi, what convinced you that your personal journey could be made into a film? Well, um, how we met was that uh, my partner, Bridget, was at a pub at the end of our street. And, uh, and she uh, went to hear, it was an open mic night. And she went uh, uh, to see what was going on. I think she was going for a drink with a friend of hers and Femi was there. And he uh, had just, I think, finished at university and was singing a song about Belgian Congo. And uh, I had already been working on this film for uh, some time and uh, was preparing as trying to work out how best to sort of to, to, to actually realize the film and make it. And then, and the thing that was missing, I suppose at the time was really uh, a, a way of collaborating with a younger person to actually make this story not feel like it's some history about the past that we don't really need to be concerned about unless it's some kind of intellectual inquiry but actually it's something that matters about the present and even you know f and, and, and the future and uh, so yeah uh, my partner had gone down to see that Femi in the pub and I thought wow this guy is just sort of you know, he's uh, 23, I think you were at the time, Femi, uh, and you were already writing stuff about uh, Belgian Congo. And then also, I think the next day I checked into his YouTube, he had uh, some videos on YouTube, and he had something, a song called France Afrique, which was like a poem thing that he'd done in his boat, which was about French African uh, imperialism. And I thought, wow, I mean, this guy's already thinking about this kind of same kind of stuff that I had been thinking about because I had already been working on a kind of a film about colonialism that involved somehow integrating Joseph Conrad and this episode, which, uh, you know, was a rather obscure episode, which uh, I'd found out about and then shared with Femi about the, how at the same time that, that The Heart of Darkness was written, this sort of almost real life Kurtz was kind of doing all of this stuff in Niger. So I thought this was, uh, you know, uh, uh, extraordinary kind of uh, find at the end of my own, at the end of my own road. <laughs> Indeed, I was um, already living on a boat, <laughs> and you'll see in the film there's there's lots of um, lots of lots of boat dwelling at the beginning and the end uh, in Oxford. I'd graduated from the university um, and um, had kind of started looking at colonialism and, and, and that kind of thing whilst there. Um, and I was writing this, these poems and these songs um, about colonial history um, off the basis of that. And I met with Rob and we got talking and we had long discussions um, in, of all places, Oxford Union <laughs> and on the kind of little terrace next to, next to my boat, uh, well, not terrace, towpath next to the boat about colonial history and the rest. And then, yeah, we shot a pilot film and next thing you knew, um, well, not quite next thing you knew, but after a short while we were off to Niger to film a film about French colonial history. Um, and so, yeah, it was kind of a, meet, a meeting of minds, which was, um, which happened in, a, in, well, not a meeting of minds, a meeting of minds, a meeting of a mind and then the partner of a mind who is herself um, uh, quite clever as well. <laughs> um, and then a meeting after that uh, in a cafe, which led, and one thing led to another and then yeah now we have a film. So um, the story set in Niger and is historically linked to French colonialism obviously in the film you link it to Britain's colonial um, history what do you think of the parallels between say for instance Britain and Nigeria which is where your your and my heritage is from for me and um, mm -hmm. like Britain with all other former colonies as well. So, I mean, there are strong parallels. There's a scene in the film where we talk about how this massacre is um, representative of wider European massacres at the time, and that includes the Belgian Congo, that includes Britain um, in, in Sudan, um, that includes um, Germany in Namibia, and it goes on and on and on, right? The idea was that um, these European powers were racing against each other to um, kind of see who'd colonize most. And in the same way that um, the French wanted to have a continuous landmass from 
the east to the west of Africa, which is something that we explore in this film. The UK, famously under Cecil Rhodes, wanted a continuous railroad going from, he called it Cape Town to Cairo, right? From the north to the south. And so you have these, these parallels between the idea of imperial domination, uh, between this brutal history of um, kind of, of basically enslavement and domination um, between the colonial histories of um, Niger and the the of, of France even and the colonial history of the UK and I mean and I mean and it's it's the things like the Berlin Conference which is where Leopold um, of Belgium was given the Belgian Congo in order to take dominance this was a lot of European countries meeting together in Germany in order to divide Europe up I mean in order to divide Africa up as though it was a great pie right which they could all take a slice of um, and so yeah it's not just that there's parallels it's that they were in it um, together in a way and and, and splitting up uh, the continent that we both come from um, between them for its, its, its wealth. There's a part in the film for me um, where you have an honest discussion with your guides about how they perceive you to be responding to what you're uncovering. Um, this kind of resonated with me because it brought up the complex kind of insider outsider identity um, that like people who are like first or second generation like immigrant or like living somewhere else um, which permeate, permeates through the film, the perspective of the film, but it's also a journey of itself. Like what effect did that conversation have on you and your outlook? Yeah, so that conversation was obviously it's quite difficult to be told that you you look like you're <laughs> you're you're kind of not not emotionally involved. But um it's exactly what Hassan said in the scene, right? When I was in Oxford beforehand reading about colonialism, it was all through the spectrum of libraries and the rest. It wasn't first hand testimony from people on the ground. And you're not seeing it in the same way, and you're also not seeing the effects of it every day when you are supposed to do an interview with someone the next day and they can't do it because um their their partner has just died of a preventable disease right this is the, like the, all of this reality of the um the kind of um legacy of colonialism was hitting very hard and it becomes somewhat overwhelming and at the same time you don't want to seem too um emotional it's like what right do you have as the quote unquote privileged Western are going over there to be reacting so heavily emotionally when the people there they if something happens they're used to it, it has to happen it, someone dies um, they, they talk about this history and then they get on with their lives because there's the urgency there of everyday survival and so I feel as though indeed once they spoke to me in that way I felt as though I could open up more and, and show more of what I was feeling and look at it less from an academic perspective or more on a personable perspective. When I spoke to the uranium miners, for example, um, when we got to Dankori and I started to speak at them. And also as I learned more of the language and learned more of the cultural norms and started to kind of connect more on that level, because I feel as though we had a lot of members in the crew who were um, white, like um, French, photography and the rest and I feel as though the barrier of, 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 of I was there and yes I had dreadlocks um, and, and a scruffy beard and so I looked a bit different from most Nigerians in that respect but the physical barrier of kind of how I looked was never there in the same way but the language and the cultural barriers were still there and as I started to kind of overcome them a bit and definitely as I kind of got permission it felt like for me um, from Amina and Hassan to become more emotionally involved that was definitely a, a turning, well, not emotionally involved, but to become more expressly emotionally involved, to show more of what I was feeling, that became, that, that became a kind of turning point in the journey for me. I'm, I'm going to pivot a little bit and talk about, like, climate change. So, like, the film explores Niger's, like, inventiveness with solar um, power and energy, which, aside from being an example of something positive coming from like what is overall a just a distressing story it also demonstrates a certain spirit of entrepreneurism and, and um, inventing that I think is often prevalent in like developing nations like Africa and like say for instance India and places like that. Do you see a difference between the conversation about climate change in Africa compared to the UK? Yeah, it was one of the things that we didn't get to explore as much as we'd have liked to in the film, just because you can't say everything in one and a half hours is the issue of deforestation. Um, I mean, we have references to trees. We have a scene with Tashi where he talks about the spirits in the trees, but it became 
too much to flesh out the solar aspect and the spiritual animism element of the trees and in any real depth the deforestation element but Niger has seen um, wide deforestation due to the effects of climate change and is as one of the hottest countries in the world um, a country in which rising um, heat um, it can become a real problem. I mean, the months in which we were able to go and film um, were determined by the, 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 the heat because sometimes the energy is so hot that no one will come out and do interviews with you <laughs> if you go there, right? Um, and so we had to kind of structure when we were going to go there depending on, on, on the heat. And so climate change is, both, is definitely a pressing issue in Niger. Um, as is energy independence, um, you saw the, the juxtaposition of uranium and, and solar um, and the idea of moving towards um, solar. But I think on the everyday level in Niger, people don't necessarily have the discussion about climate change in the same way they do here because there's not that, that, that level of um, quote unquote development in which people are, in, in, in which in a village, you, you understand why it's getting hotter every year and why there's this deforestation, right? That it's linked to the idea of the Iskoski, this, the spirits and the rest. And so I think, whereas in the UK, the debate on climate change is regressive because of the right and, and the influence of various um, large energy companies um, purposefully obfuscating, it's different in Niger. Do you have anything to add to that, Rob? Well, I just would like to make the point, I suppose, growing out of the, from the film, um, the, the Omar, the guy that you see that Femi meets teaching about solar history, solar energy, is actually part of an institute which was uh, called the Abdu Mumuni Institute. And actually something, again, another thing that we weren't able to put in the film, it's frustrating, but uh, go on the website and you'll find it, hopefully, um, is that, uh, and this is going to stun you, this fact, is that the, first, the world's first solar powered machine was invented by a Nigerian in Niger, a guy called Abdul Abdu Mamouni. Uh, and he was uh, sort of, I think, is, is generally regarded as a sort of a quite an extraordinary genius. He's quite sort of, um, he wrote various books uh, in the 60s. The, the problem was that the French decided not to develop that kind of side of the uh, energy production because they discovered uranium and that they realized they could actually build uranium. So essentially the Nigerian ind independent program for solar energy relied for a short period on some German funding and then pretty much by the late 70s, early 80s had dried up. So I think that Niger is a play and, and, and Omar is part of a kind of a, a new kind of um, uh, initiative really uh, at, the, at the highest level and also at the community level to try and really bring some of the extraordinary legacy of this guy, Abdu Mamouni, and his amazing inventions and his amazing insights into the whole sort of spirit of the way that the country can go. But really with a very strong understanding that of course Niger being such a poor country is really, really struggling to actually be able to do that independently without having to kind of bring in outside investors who always have strings attached and so on and so forth. So that's the age old problem. But I think that they are doing it uh, uh, in a kind of certainly at a community level and sort of project by project. I think there's um, uh, uh, a certain initiative. And again, I hope that this film might be able to play in some small part. There is also a very good Nigerian film made by a filmmaker called Malam Sigiru about Abdu Mamouni, which came out a couple of years ago called Solaire Made in Africa, which I'd also um, Probably shouldn't be promoting other people's films, but anyway, it's a good <laughs> film. <laughs> 2020 feels like a watershed year. Um, we're at a crossroads where people are now calling for various countries to acknowledge the violence of like colonial history with the mindset that if you can't address um, something, how can you attempt to fix it if you're refusing to acknowledge that it exists? Um, where do you see UK? in this conversation? Where do you think it's heading? Do you think that there will be progress in how we discuss UK history? <laughs> <laughs> I think there may be progress. I think whether there's progress or not will depend on what people do, you know, what people, what, what, what actions people take, how people decide to organise. Clearly we've got a government that's uh, 
you know, pretty interested in um, reviving the imperial spirit of domination rather than uh, the kind of the anti-imperial spirit of resistance, which is, I suppose, is what our film is trying to sort of um, tilt toward. I think Black Lives Matter is, is, uh, has, has, has obviously got a lot of uh, renewed energy now, and I hope that that can, if, I hope that that can kind of sustain. Obviously, we have the added, added problem with this kind of stuff is very difficult to sort of mount on a kind of real human level with the pandemic and everybody being isolated in this kind of way. But I think it's really up to all of us who feel that it's an important issue or one of the important issues of the world to keep it real and active and not just active in terms of what happened far away but also what happening what is happening here in Britain as well but making those connections and I think that's one of the things I hope that this film does is that I think Niger is is not a particularly well-known country it's not even well known in France uh, it's certainly not well known here and I hope that you know one of the things that we kind of are bringing out here is that Black Lives Matter is a is an issue of global significance for people all over the world and you know and many and there are many histories and communities and societies in Africa that you know we need to connect with in order to really find a global solution to essentially the inequality that has been per per perpetrated and perpetuated by the kind of things that we show in this film. So I definitely think that the UK in terms of its curriculum and in terms of what it teaches to kids is very, very lacking in terms of colonial history. I always say um, that uh, if I say to you, divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived, what do you think of? Henry what do you think of, Lynn? Henry VIII. Exactly. Henry VIII and his wives, right? The order in which his wives died. This is taught in every school, basically, usually in primary school and secondary school. It's this big part of British history, this monarchy that we all learn about, right? But if I say the Mau Mau and Kenya, if I say um, Andaman and Sudan, right? If I talk about these periods of, these darker periods of British history, um, I'm responded to with silence because you're not taught it in school. Uh, you don't learn about this stuff. In school, when I learned about slavery, I learned about slavery in the Americas, and not even in South America, but in, in North America, rather than um, the slavery which happened not in the UK, but under the UK, in the Caribbean, in order to fund the UK's industrial revolution, right? The same revolution that we hear so much about when we learn about the steam train and we learn about the economics and this, that, the rest, right? And so the UK's history is taught through a very particular and specific um, lens, which does not look at it or engage with it critically, and which leads to us not understanding Britain today, and why Britain today has so much power, uh, why Britain today has a permanency on the UN Security Council, has a GDP per capita, which is probably more than 100 times that of Niger, um, why the UK today has, um, has um, nuclear weapons, whereas most of the countries in the world don't, right? The UK needs to understand its position of dominance in the world um, from a understanding of its historical conquest and enslavement of other peoples and that's something which i hope well this film if it doesn't spark a conversation about that at least it will spark a conversation about europe more generally and the conversations which happen about this particular french expedition can helpfully lead to us having more conversations about um the uk and what we need to do to change the uk syllabus um in order to make it more representative of our colonial history um that's all we have time for and it's been fantastic. It's been a great learning experience. Um, and just thank you for the film. Thank you uh, for talking so freely and openly about the film and the process. And um, I hope that everyone who watched the film can really take something from it. Thank you. Thank you for having us and for the, um, the searching questions. They were very, very good. <laughs> Thanks very much, Lynn. Thank you very much indeed.